Um, our next speaker is Associate Professor Karen Zwi. Karen is a community consultant community paediatrician at the Sydney Children's Hospital and an Associate Professor at UNSW. In 2006, she chaired the College of Physicians Policy Committee on the Health of Refugee Children in Australia and New Zealand and continues to be a key advocate for the College on Refugee Child Health Matters. She's involved in service development for refugee children in southeastern Sydney and the Illawarra and she represents the College of Physicians on the Australian Human Rights Commission inquiry into children in detention. Um, good evening everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge the first peoples of this land, um, the Aboriginal people joining us here today and also the last peoples of this land, the asylum seekers who have come to our shores to seek our protection. Um, I'm speaking today not on behalf of the Commission, but as um, one of the paediatricians that joined the Commission in their visit to Christmas Island and Darwin. I'm just going to speak really tonight about Christmas Island, um, but I'm really speaking about my own observations um, as opposed to any findings that the Commission might be making into the future. And also, what I've tried to do is not represent the academic literature or anything that many of you would be aware of in relation to the harms caused by detention, because all of that is well known, um, but to honour the voices of the children in the way they spoke to us, in the kinds of things that their parents said to us, and in their drawings, um, because I think they do it so much more eloquently than I can. Um, we have put up in the foyer some of the drawings, poems and stories given to us by children in detention. Um, I'll skim through things that I think you know, but just by way of very brief background, um, we have a quota system, we have an offshore program where we accept refugees from, um, uh, from refugee camps selected by um, the UN and resettled in Australia, usually given permanent visas and ultimately citizenship. Um, that is not really the sort of arena that we're talking about at the moment. We're focusing on those asylum seekers that come to our shores predominantly by boat um, because those are the people that are subject to the policy of mandatory detention. Um, so mandatory detention means that if you come by boat, you are basically detained as the default option, as opposed to most other countries where you have to have a very specific reason to be kept in detention. This policy applies to children, pregnant women, and essentially anybody who arrives by boat. In general, until recently, people were taken to Christmas Island and that is where their processing would commence and then they were resettled, not resettled, but they may be processed in detention somewhere else on the mainland. Um, but since September 2002 and more actively July um, 19, 2013, sorry, 2012 and then 2013, um, we've had a very proactive policy about offshore processing, so nobody who arrives by boat will be processed in Australia. That means even if you're on Christmas Island, no processing will commence, <clears throat> and you will be transferred to Manus Island or Nauru, where your processing will begin. There will, you'll never be resettled in Australia, and there will be no exceptions. So, as Gillian was saying, around a thousand children um, in detention at the time that I did this Christmas Island visit. A child is under the age of 18. Children are no longer kept in detention centres. In a technical sense, we call them alternative places of detention, or APODs. Um, the difference between an APOD and a detention centre is somewhat technical, and if you ask how this came to be called an APART, apart from the signage difference. There are a couple of very tiny differences like razor wire instead of barbed wire, which I think might escape uh, a three-year-old's perspective. Um, we spoke unrestricted to detainees. We had about an, uh, a week on Christmas Island. We were given free access to talk to whomever we wished. We were given lots of interpreters. It was actually a fantastically open environment for us to talk to detainees. Um, at the same time, people handed us letters. Children were given drawing materials. Um, and as I say, I'm presenting some of my observations. That there is a letter from a particular language group. What they've done is 
uh, fingerprint every child, put their boat number and their age, and then write a letter to us from the children in detention. Um, I've just put up the pictures for you to make your own meaning of them, but very often you see the theme of the fences, the sad children in detention with very distressed faces, and then the children outside with you know the flowers and the butterflies, and this child is asking, where's the difference? What's the difference um, between us and them, of course? Um, 27 babies under a year of age, so lots of young babies. Most of these were born in detention, um, and almost 200 kids under the age of five. Um, around 100 teenagers, this is Christmas Island alone, um, 42 of whom were unaccompanied children, which means that they had no family adult older than the age of 21 to look after them. Um, this is the kind of facilities people have access to, so they call these this Donga style accommodation. It's essentially old shipping containers. They're all in a long row with rooms very close together and a shaded area between. And there will also be a communal eating area where people are served dormitory style um, you know, mess hall food, and there may be a shaded area in the middle of the compound where people can gather in the shade. Um, that's a typical, what they call a family room, so it's two single beds. If you happen to have two children, they may have to share at the top, mother and baby at the bottom, and you may get a mattress for dad if he's around. Um, and these are called en suites. You have the luxury of your own toilet, which is good because those that don't have the en-suites have these really appalling communal toilet facilities for all detainees, clearly insufficient um, and not well maintained. So that's the typical accommodation that you'll see on Christmas Island. None of these are photographs that we took from inside the detention centre because we weren't allowed permission to do so, but these are all freely available. Um, so what did we find? Um, we really talked to people. We didn't undertake formal medical assessments or medical examinations. So again, these are sort of very general observations. As you'd expect in a tropical climate, lots of infected skin lesions, impetigo, lots of fungal infections of the skin and hair. Um, People complained bitterly about dental problems, dental pain that was keeping children awake at night and not allowing them to eat. Um, and children with special needs really not getting their needs met in the way that we would expect. So children requiring hearing aids or having lost their glasses en route to Australia or complaining that they um, couldn't see and hadn't you know, needed a new pair of glasses or whatever, that would generally not be dealt with in a very timely fashion. Those are the famous Christmas Island crabs. Um, they have been one of the wonders of the world, according to David Attenborough. Tens of millions of them cross from the forest to the sea every year. And um, they're an endangered species, and it, you will be fined $3,000 if you drive over a crab. One of the things that the detainees said to us, a few, was that people care more about the crabs on Christmas Island than they do about the detainees. What did we see in terms of child development? Um, we know a lot about the impact of a very harsh physical environment on children's development. Children need a nurturing, safe, stimulating environment um, in order to develop, and they also need parents who are coping, who are positive, and who are building a sense of safety and future for them. We know a lot about the mental health of adults in detention, so I won't um, harbour on that point. But the physical space is extremely harsh. What this child has drawn here, and I'm sure Mark will tell you about it on um, Nauru as well, is this phosphate soil that exists everywhere from the phosphate mines. Um, it's an incredibly harsh, crunchy, painful surface on which to walk, and children cannot be put down to crawl or move around in that environment. Um, and that child has actually drawn those dots. You can see the sort of dots that he's drawn underfoot. Um, apart from the mental health of parents, there's been very little attention given to appropriate toys, 
and reading materials for parents to read in their own comfortable languages to their children. So all of these are no shaded areas for play. So there is a one in, in the three compounds where children are kept, one of them has a, a plastic children's playground, unbearably hot during the day. You really can't even touch it um, with no shade. So I think it's you know fairly obvious that children's development cannot be optimised, and in fact many children, many parents complained about children actually regressing and losing skills that they had once um, acquired. My child chooses only chooses black colours for painting and clothes to wear. Now this is actually something we've seen. Um, over the years with distressed children, choosing black as a way of indicating one's distress, one's fear and one's sadness is a very powerful way for a child um, to tell you of their distress. Uh, wakes once or twice at night, lots of parents told us about children not sleeping well. The doctor says to keep away black colours. Really interesting approach in terms of is that really going to solve the problem. Um, overwhelmingly, in an institutional environment like this, parents' um, capacity to be highly functioning parents and the parents that they would like to be becomes extremely undermined, and family functioning itself is very undermined. You can see the privacy, you can see not having meals together um, undermines the discipline and the family functioning. In addition, people, when they first arrive on Christmas Island, are issued with plastic cutlery and crockery, which they have to keep and look after. Three times a day, they line up with their plate and their knife and fork and get handed their food at the mess, you know, at the hall. Um, before they do that, they have to present their boat number, which is much larger than their name, on their ID card. And this is including children. Everybody walks around with their ID card and get ticked off. Um, and in addition to that ticking off, they will be checked at 6 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock at night with torches and going around into people's room and checking that they're there. Um, so that head count, the boat numbers that Gillian mentioned, um, is you know, very prominent. People know each other's boat numbers. When you say, I'm Karen, what's your name? People's first response is, this is my number. Um, when we say, how do people generally refer to you, um, the response was, well, it's like our boat number is our first name. Um, the other thing that was very undermining for mothers of young children is this kind of rationing system. So you've got a certain amount of nappies and a certain amount of milk powder. Um, and it's very interesting because in other mainland detention centers that does not occur. That is not part of the policy. Um, it is not necessary, but it had become the kind of culture of Christmas Island. So you had to line up for your nappies. When those were finished, you had to go back into the queue and ask for more nappies, um, which is very undermining for a parent who may just have had a cesarean section, who doesn't feel like getting up and going to you know, ask for these basic facilities. Um, what came through very, very strongly is that people came with skills and felt very motivated when they first arrived to use their skills and found it very difficult to understand why they couldn't. So as Gillian was saying, people didn't go to, the kids weren't going to school. We had a university educated maths teacher who said, I'm more than happy to teach these kids. Um, but she wasn't allowed to undertake that activity. Similarly, there was a chef who was happy to assist in the kitchen. Um, there was a plumber who had noted various you know, defects and leaking toilets and bits and pieces around the place, but he wasn't allowed to use his skills. Um, and so people talk a lot about this boredom, frustration, and losing my mind. We know in the literature it takes three to four months for adults to lose their mind or to start declining cognitive function in this sort of setting. For children, we believe it's much more in the region of two to four weeks, which is why all the recommendations say you shouldn't hold children at all, and if, if so, a maximum of two weeks. Single mother of two young children. Yesterday I smashed chairs. If, I, if allowed, I would break all windows. We went through the big ocean and here for eight months from a bad situation to a worse situation. When the officers go home, the kids say, shall we go with them one day? I'm so ashamed in front of our kids. So again, the sense of I'm not the parent I know I can be because this environment is not allowing me to be a decent parent. Um, this story of children latching on to people as they left the detention center, we actually witnessed that several times where you 
literally had to pry a child off. They see the people coming and going as their access to freedom, which is terribly sad. Um, why? I come for Australia, not Nauru or Manus. Everybody knows about Nauru and Manus. Reza Bharati had been killed two weeks before we arrived. Every child knew Reza Bharati's name. Um, I can't back Iran. And they also talk about I can't back because everybody says, why don't, apparently guards will ask, why don't you go back? Um, I can't back, but I'm died. And this is a child who's drawn, you know, tears. The only colour is red. And that's Tony Abbott with a smile on his face. Um, suicide and self-harm, enormous amount of literature on this in adults. And we know it's 40 times the Australian suicide rate. My concern is, of course, it's horrific for adults, but for children to be a witness to the distress in parents who are meant to be caring for them is really unbearable. Um, a young boy broke the windows. All the kids saw him trying to self-harm with the broken window. We are losing our minds. And then other parents telling us how distressing it was because they couldn't protect their children from witnessing this incident, very well aware that it was harmful for their own children, but they have no capacity to be able to protect their children. Um, distress and sadness. Evident people told us that they were crying themselves to sleep. Children had become withdrawn. They were once reading, weren't reading. They had learned to do something and had forgotten it, lost their motivation, lost their interest in learning, bedwetting. Loads of kids were bedwetting who had been dry just before they arrived. Nightmares, tantrums, playing out their distress in games. This is very well described in a lot of literature where the kids were saying, you know, you be the circo guard. I'll, I'll, or I'll be the guard. I'll pat you down. Or... Um, my boat's drowning, come help save me. And these are the kinds of games they're playing because they're working through um, their distress. My daughter says to me, Mum, I wish I were drowning in the ocean because I think to die once and for all, it's better than every day is dying. Um, people spoke a lot about how they felt a sense of torture, that there was no end in sight, that it just went on and on. Every day was the same, nothing to do. Nobody would tell me what was going to happen next, and that was the torture. Um, the other thing that I think was a little bit of a shock to me was the extent of family separation. Um, so if anybody needed, because Christmas Island is so remote, there are no specialists there or very few visiting specialists. If anybody needs any specialist attention or even allied health assessment, um, they have to be flown over to Darwin. They're limited flights, limited numbers of plane, uh, seats on the flight. You need guards with every detainee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Multiple logistical problems. And although the department um, policy is not to separate families. Ultimately, pragmatically, families were separated. Um, for medical appointments, for childbirth, nobody gives birth on Christmas Island. Um, they had got into the habit, again, not necessarily the policy and not necessary on the mainland, of when a child turns 18, he would be separated from his family of origin and put in the adult male compound, which is a much more harsh environment and which often meant he no longer had access to those precious two weeks at school. Um, the 40 unaccompanied children were an amazing group of kids from all over the world, Afghanistan, or, um, Somalia, come from enormous distances, had been en route to Australia for weeks to months, typically. Um, you'll all know about the, you know, the well-described conflict of interest in that these children don't, their legal guardian is the Minister for Immigration, who is also responsible for enacting the policy of mandatory detention. So whereas in a child rights sense, acting in their best interests would be nurturing them, reading to them, getting them to school and doing their homework, keeping them in detention cannot possibly be in their best interest and there's an obvious conflict of interest. Nonetheless, he doesn't take that on himself, the minister, but delegates it to the centre manager who's actually really busy with a full-time job and this is not a job that is taken on as a major activity. It's only a bureaucratic role that comes up when there's a problem or a signature is required. Um, the kids described how if they claimed to be under 18, there was a very rigorous process where they had to front up 
and answer questions for as long as an hour and a half about when they were born, what was going on, how old were their parents, how old were their siblings, lots of answer, questions that they didn't have the answers to, at the end of which it was determined whether they were under 18 or over 18, and during this process no advocate is present, so they're very much alone um, in that process. And they also talked very sadly about their fear of transfer. When they turn 18, they may be sent to Nauru or Manus, when they, and they their perception was we'll go there to die, like Reza Bharati, or even just separation from their family of origin to the adult detention centre. They talked about how they'd been on very long journeys with their friends, their friends had become their family, um, they get woken at six in the morning, given half an hour to pack their things, and then told, okay, you're off to this place or that place, without an opportunity to say goodbye to people that they've become very close to. Um, nonetheless, children are children and adolescents amaze me um, and they were still very hopeful in between the tears. And I love this young woman who said, we need to keep smiling and one day life will get tired of upsetting us and make the rest of our lives beautiful. Um, for me, these kids could teach our children so much. Their main aim in life was to get an education. They wanted to be the next generation of educated Australians, is the way they put it. Um, so we know all these synergistic risks, they're well described, the parental hopelessness, reduced parental autonomy, lack of a safe environment, inadequate play and educational facilities, witnessing traumatic events, these accumulate to produce a much poorer mental health and developmental outcome in children. Um, and these are known to the government as well, this is very well documented literature. Um, unfortunately, the protected Protective factors are few and far between. The access to education outside of the centre was really not well enacted, um, and most people had been for two weeks. Um, and for younger children, there really was almost nothing to give them an escape from this harsh environment. Um, adults talked a lot about the sense of injustice, that they boarded the boat you know, or they started their journey many months before these new regulations came in and they were really quite shocked about the fact that they wouldn't be processed or ever resettled in Australia. Um, they were very distressed the fact that there was absolutely no processing. Nobody had asked any questions. Um, so very often we heard, thank you for listening, you're the first person I've told my story to. Um, some people showed us the UNHCR refugee cards. They had already been processed in Indonesia. I don't know the numbers, um, but because they were awaiting resettlement, they hopped on a boat and arrived. The fact that they'd been reprocessed, uh, already processed, is irrelevant because our regulations were no processing will be undertaken. So that was very frustrating for them. Um, they were gathered together, they told us every few days to be told you will never be resettled in Australia. And when people said, well, where will we go? The answer very often was, and probably still is today, we really don't know. Maybe Nauru, maybe Cambodia, maybe PNG, but this incredible sense of uncertainty and where will I be in five years' time, nobody has any idea. Um, people said to us, I've done a crime, okay, I get that, I came by boat, I'm not supposed to, what's the sentence, I'll do that, and then can we get on with our lives? Uncertainty, nobody had had legal advice, even though legally I understand that they do have a right to do so, but there's so many barriers that it's just not possible. What have I done if I was born in a dictatorship country? What wrong have we done that we seek asylum to you? What wrong have our children done that they come with us? Does not it a great catastrophe for parents and society? We must not weeping for this terrible issues. And again, I don't know what I must reply to our children, that powerlessness of parents trying to protect their children. Um, so we know about the Convention of the uh, Rights of the Child. I'll leave it to you to think whether we are violating any of those. And um, finally, that's the giant robber crab, that's the biggest terrestrial invertebrate on the planet. It is the only, Christmas Island is the only place it exists and apparently the detention center and the uh, phosphate mining have placed it in danger. And I thought it was rather interesting, that very beautiful bird is also near extinction and it's called the Abbot's booby. 
<laughs> um, thank you very much. <laughs>